Okay, good morning. I'm sure this is some kind of April's Fool's Day, that in 30 seconds, everyone will storm into the classroom and say, April Fool, we're really here. We didn't miss the class. Okay, we'll see. Today I'm going to complete my introduction and analysis of chapter eight of The Prince so that we can make progress on that side of our class. And then as usual, we're going to watch scenes from a movie with a Machiavellian character and the character will be once again, Tom Ripley, but this time a very different kind of Tom Ripley, an older, more mature, more in control sociopath, still one, played by John Malkovich in Ripley's Game, directed by Italian director Liliana Cavani, and a movie that came out in 2002. Oh. Hello. So, together with chapter seven, chapter eight of The Prince is really essential for the understanding of Machiavellian, of, of Machiavelli's system, of Machiavelli's view of politics, society, and leadership. In this chapter, through the use of explicit language and direct references, Machiavelli comes out and tells the readers directly that he's very well aware of the fact that his system is contrary to any kind of ethical framework, any kind of morality, traditional morality, that his recommendations, his strategies, his examples of leadership go against the groove of what is considered positive about a leader. And he implies that his own system from a strictly pragmatic point of view is in fact better because the results don't change whether you call the behaviors and practices that produce those results cruel or not, the results are there. The results are there to prove that a positive change was produced. And therefore, you can very well judge the behavior of a leader from their results. And if you do so, then what you call cruelty is virtue. And what people call virtue is something really often irrelevant in the context. Irrelevant because it would not be able to ensure the same kind of results. Machiavelli relies on two examples uh, that are expressed at length. Uh, each has many lines, not, not a big amount. The book itself is a short book, so it's a page, a page and a half for each example. One is from classical history, the example of a Greek tyrant of Sicily during the third century BC, when Sicily had been colonized by the Greeks, at least on the shores. The other example is from Machiavelli's own times, Oliverotto da Fermo, whom, whom he calls Liverotto, who was in fact the leader, became the leader by killing his own uncle, who was like a father to him, by planning the, this murder in a very duplicitous and a very Machiavellian way, Oliverotto, uh, establishes his power over one of the city-states in the Italian Northeast, which will be engaged in a war with Cesare Borgia, and in fact, Oliverotto himself will be one of the leaders, of the local leaders, that will fall victim to the trap set up by Cesare Borgia when Cesare Borgia invites the local leaders to the town of Sinigallia 
to discuss peace negotiations, and, and after they come to the city, uh, they're all captured and killed. At the end of the chapter, in the last two paragraphs, that's when Machiavelli will explain his theory and explain that all the actions taken by these two leaders would not be called virtue within the traditional frame, the frame of traditional morality. However, since those behaviors, those practices, those actions produced good results, good leadership, it's unavoidable that there is a change that needs to be made. So be careful when you read references to the word virtue in this chapter. Machiavelli is being ironic. He knows, he's aware that from the point of view of traditional morality, the, action of, the actions of these leaders are not moral. And again, keep in mind that Machiavelli's intention is not to replace traditional morality, is not to delegitimize traditional morality entirely. Machiavelli is simply implying that in politics, in the game of politics, success, obtaining the outcome that you set for your leadership is everything. And therefore, whether you call something virtue or cruelty, what counts is the end result. However, Machiavelli is saying that you can very well call something that was cruel as such. Meaning that these leaders may not go down in history as glorious leaders. And he says that explicitly, Machiavelli. However, the game of politics, he implies, is a dirty game. It is not about glory. In fact, even if you wanted with all your heart as a leader to be a glorious leader, honest, virtuous leader, you'll find oftentimes circumstances in the context where you operate that will require a different kind of game. A game that other people will call immoral, cruel, evil, etc. So Machiavelli uses the word virtue in here ironically because he knows what virtue is according to conventional morality. And he uses cruelty at the end of this chapter Ironically, meaning I know that everything I'm showing to you, the readers, will be called cruel by, and therefore will, will have a negative judgment imposed on it by most people. However, what counts is this, is success. Were these two leaders successful? Yes, they were, especially Agathocles. And therefore, from a Machiavellian, or we could simply say from a pragmatic point of view, their cruelty needs to be called virtue. And there is an you know, ironic reversal in the applicability of these terms that plays out in this chapter. From the point of view of morality, this success could be called with any number of negative labels. And again, Machiavelli is not saying morality is dead. God is dead, there is no morality. It's just saying within the game of politics, there is no room for <clears throat> considerations that would not be relevant, that would not be applicable to reaching the goal that a leader set for themselves. The other all important element in this chapter, which is one on which we have insisted multiple times, is that a cruelty that leads to success is the kind of cruelty that is limited and therefore that is used only as a strict necessity. And these leaders, especially Agathocles, are considered good examples because they were able to switch from cruelty or evil ways when it was necessary to the use of influence. And Machiavelli emphasizes that they were in fact good leaders, 
even though people might call them cruel and people might not celebrate them at all because of the evil things they did. But in fact, the proof is in the pudding. They gained so much influence over their states, over their subjects, that they must have done something that we should call virtuous. And let me just read a couple of passages to reinforce this and to call your attention on the key passages. The first one is from the last paragraph of page 63. This is chapter 8. And yet, one cannot call it virtue to kill one's fellow citizens, right? This is Machiavelli embracing the point of view of traditional morality, but then by the end of the chapter, Machiavelli takes the opposite position, right? It's a rhetorical scheme. One cannot call, call it virtue to kill one's fellow citizens, to betray one's friends, to be without faith, without compassion, without religion, because all of those things are attached to the traditional concept of political virtue. But then when you see, this is the development of the reason, when you see that that leader was successful without the attributes of traditional virtue, then you know that something needs to be changed. Such manners may be used to acquire rule, but not glory. And again, we talked about the tragic fate of leaders, of the Machiavellian leaders, of the Machiavellian leaders as tragic feature, figures because they do something that is good, but they don't reap the benefits in terms of long-term celebrity. In terms of influence over their citizens, that's fine, but posterity will be harsh in their judgment. For if one were to consider Agathocles' virtue in entering into and escaping dangers and the greatness in his, of his spirit in enduring and overcoming adverse things, one does not see why he should be judged inferior to any most excellent captain. So Machiavelli is saying, he's a good leader. It doesn't matter that he wasn't virtuous based on the traditional standard. He's a good leader because he, he produced uh, an outcome. He reached the, the, the outcome. Nonetheless, and Machiavelli, there is an entire book written, um, uh, the famous one, about Machiavelli's use of nonetheless, which is very ironic, right? Because it seems like Machiavelli is adding a corollary, and instead, this is where Machiavelli comes out. The, the, the book on, on the use of Machiavelli's nonetheless is by Carlo Ginsburg, came out in 2015. Nonetheless, his bestial cruelty and he inhumanity with infinite wicked deeds do not admit that he should be celebrated. So Machiavelli is saying, well, okay, he, he will not be famous, right? Because posterity, long-term fame are based on other concepts. Does it matter? For the political gain, it doesn't matter because it doesn't take from the order, stability, and growth that he ensured for the city of Syracuse in Sicily during his time. And the next passage I want to call to your attention is the last paragraph of page 65. And again, this is after the second example of Oliverotto da Fermo has been suggested. Okay? I believe that this... Uh, Okay, now let, let's take it from the beginning. Anyone might wonder how it happened that Ad Agathocles and anyone like him, such as El Oliverotto, after infinite betrayals and cruelties, could live securely, right? Success is evident, cannot be denied. Securely in his fatherland for so long, and defend himself from external enemies while yet his own citizens never conspired against him. Which means Agathocles was successful because yes, he used cruelty, but then he stopped. He used cruelty when it was necessary to ensure order, stability, and guarantee the conditions for growth in his society. 
and then he gained influence. And meanwhile, many others have not been able to maintain their states by means of cruelty, even in peaceful times, not to mention in the uncertain times of war, where Machiavelli is saying cruelty has to be used based on necessity. And Machiavelli is coming out in the most clear way, telling you that he's not apologizing for cruelty. He's not defending the use of cruelty in itself. Cruelty is good only if it is instrumental to success and only if it is used um, based on strict necessity, not because you, you are a sadist at the political level. Cruelties may be called well used if it is permitted to speak well of evil. Machiavelli again pays homage to traditional morality, saying, I, I, I don't want to take away your right to call this evil. But it doesn't matter. Cruelty may be called well used when they are done all at once, out of necessity of securing oneself. And when afterward, they are not insisted upon, but are converted as much as possible into utility for the subjects. So the end game is order, stability, security in inside society, security from external enemy, and those are considered to be the conditions for growth. Because the use of influence is part of a quasi-capitalist understanding of modern society, where citizens, especially the elites, the entrepreneurs, the merchants, need to have confidence in their leader and confidence in the future of their community before they commit their resources and their time to developing the economy. And that, in turn, a successful economy will provide the leader with the resources that are necessary to maintain an army, to use force, even in times of peace, as a deterrent uh, against possible attacks. Cruelties badly used are those even if they're few at the beginning, that are instead grow over time rather than extinguish themselves. You cannot continue to rely on the use of force. Those princes who observe the first manner may have some remedy for their state with God and with man, as Agathocles did. For the others, it is impossible to maintain themselves. For this, and it continues on page 66, for this should be noted that in seizing a state, the one who occupies it should consider carefully all those offenses that is necessary for him to commit. Again, it's a call for the understanding that cruelty in itself doesn't have a positive value. Evil or any kind of Machiavellian strategies are not the solution which is why a simple book such as Stanley Bing's What Would Machiavelli Do is completely wrong, because it's just saying, oh, think of yourself, be evil, do whatever you want, don't, don't, don't be affected by your remorse, your, your conscience. Just go ahead and do it, whereas Machiavelli is saying cruelty is well used, is a political instrument, only if it is necessary within a context. There is no universal law. It's all about the context and the game. And so it is necessary and to commit all of them, the, the cruelties, at once, so as not to have to renew them every day, because if you renew them every day, then you'll never gain influence, right? You'll be feared initially, and then you will be hated by the subjects. Whereas Machiavelli wants to have fear based on the possible or the actual use of cruelty alongside support. That is to say, there has to be some collaborative game played out in this kind of society, even when the assumption is for Machiavellian times, Machiavelli's times, that the leader is kind of a dictator, right? The leader has all the power and the leader can oppress the citizens, can take any of the citizens and put them in jail, torture them, kill them, eliminate them. At the same time, this can only be done 
out of necessity because otherwise there wouldn't be any kind of cooperation, any kind of collaboration between the leader and the citizens, a collaborative relationship and collaboration and cooperation within society towards the end goal of society, which for Machiavelli is already what the goal is for us, that is to say economic growth. Power, because power and, and political military power and economic power are, are already seen as combined because Machiavelli lives in a period when to have a good army, you need to pay good soldiers, which are mercenaries, you need to have special weapons, right? Artillery and similar weapons, uh, handguns, rifles that are very expensive already. You need to have uh, other technologies as well. Already they had flamethrowers. Uh, they had uh, the Greek fire, which was similar to napalm, etc. But all of those things were uh, expensive to develop as a technology in terms of production, produce and deploy, train the soldiers, etc. So the idea is that there is a strong connection between economic growth and political power, right? And everything else is seen as secondary in life. This was my introduction to chapter eight so that we can say we've, we're done with chapter seven and eight and we'll be able to proceed uh, more quickly because we've done even though we've only done eight chapters but we've done now the three or four chapters in the first part of the book where, where the ideology of Machiavelli is laid out clearly and, and many of the other chapters are just an elaboration over these theories and, and the discussion of some of the details. So I will introduce now the scenes from Ripley's Game, the film from 2002, where we see an older Tom Ripley. The film is based on the third installation of the series of novels in a series of five novels written by Patricia Highsmith with this character. And uh, it is also the basis for another in some ways more celebrated, at least by critics, by movie critics, film, The American Friend, 1974, by Wim Wenders, even though it is more of an artsy movie, a, a nice movie, but a movie that is loosely inspired, the 1974 version, by the novel. Whereas what we have now, even though the setting is completely changed from France to Italy, some of the characters uh, for example, the, the wife of Tom Ripley uh, are changed, but the movie that we have now in front of us today uh, is, is follows more closely uh, the story that you find in the novel by Patricia Highsmith. So, after the events of the first film, Tom Ripley has continued to operate as a con man uh, and, and through a series of a variety of, of scams, he has become uh, more skilled and he has become uh, wealthier. In the books that follow uh, the talented Miss Ripley, we see, among other things, Ripley involved in forgeries and uh, uh, art dealings. Uh, he... he uh, is, is producing and managing to, to overseeing the production and, and then selling uh, uh, forged works of art. And in fact, at the very beginning of the movie, that's where we see, uh, I don't like the first scene. It's, it's, it's not done well. And it doesn't really have enough continuity, even though after the first scene, you will see a writing on the uh, screen that says three years later, but there isn't enough continuity. There is a clear conflict between the character in the first scene and, and the character we see later, but they need to establish the premise because th there is a problem from the past that comes up, comes out to, to haunt uh, Ripley. I, I just think it's not uh, uh, nicely, executed 
although I don't think that's the issue with the film, the film is, is, is a nice film. It's, it's really able to uh, tell a story in a nice way, has good rhythm, a good pace. From a cinematic standpoint, the only criticism I can direct to the uh, film and the film's director is the poor use of uh, photography, which is very mimetic, uh, but more could have been done with the autumn atmosphere of the story, which most of the story is set in northern Italy and then Berlin for a part of it. So at the beginning of the story, we see in the beginning of the film, we see Tom Ripley, John Malkovich trying to sell fake art to a German collector. And then this doesn't go well because Ripley is asking for an incredible and extraordinary amount of money, which is not even realistic. Fake art or stolen art is worth at best 10% of its uh, actual value on, in, in, in criminal examples in real life. The deal goes awry and Ripley being the sociopath that he is, because in this movie, Ripley is even more Machiavellian, more in control, but still a sociopath. Uh, Ripley kills the uh, uh, private guard, the bodyguard of this um, collector and leaves. Three years later, we find Ripley in the Veneto region, uh, living in a, an incredible Palladian villa near Vicenza, Andrea Palladio was a master of neoclassicism, and this is one of the best examples. Uh, you'll see it's, it's an incredible setting. He uh, um, lives with a, a companion or a partner, it might be his wife, but it's never said explicitly, who's a talented young woman and a talented musician played by Italian and international actress Chiara Caselli and uh, he interacts with the locals, right? There is a village nearby or a small town, there are neighbors. Among those neighbors there is someone who sometimes works for Ripley, a frame maker, a local artisan and a restorer, Jonathan Trivani, a, a British man who li who's living in Italy with his wife and has a small son. Um, again, he does some work in the villa for Ripley, and therefore it's all too natural that Ripley, since Ripley plays the nice guy, is more duplicitous and more in control here, as I said, uh, Ripley gets invited to Trevani's house for his birthday. Ripley goes there by himself because his wife or companion is uh, rehearsing training for a concert in Vicenza that will take place two weeks later and uh, Trevani doesn't know that Ripley has, is in the house, has accepted the invitation and he is in the kitchen surrounded by friends preparing espresso uh, with this Italian mocha machine and um, he says some insulting things about Ripley. He says that Ripley is a noble rich, that Ripley has restored the, the, the heart uh, uh, out of this villa that is someone who has more money than taste. And this is what prompts, you have to understand, and you'll understand it completely when we watch the next series of scenes next week, this is what prompts the game that Ripley will play. Ripley doesn't have any reaction right away. He pretends not to have heard, although it's very cold, like a snake. And he uh, uh, creates a plot to take revenge. And his revenge, very Machiavellian in a way, very dark, is to transform Jonathan, who's a simple man, a father, a husband, also someone who's sick and might be dying soon because he suffers from myeloid leukemia, which is chronic, but, but very uh, serious, a very serious condition to transform him into an evil guy. 
to rip his life apart, to take him to a position where he will regret saying those things about Ripley because he will, in some ways, become like Ripley. And I don't need to add anything because uh, everything else should be clear from the film itself. As we did the last time, I'm asking you to take note, if you want now, on paper or on your phone, on your computer, and at some point, it doesn't have to be today, but at some point, post those notes on the Google Docs file where you have the assignments and where eventually you will post your final paper. As I said, we'll watch part of the film today, part of the film on Friday. If, you're, if you want, you can very well wait until next Friday and then post all of the notes at that point. It's, it's up to you. It's something that goes to your participation rate. Okay? And they don't have to be extensive notes or comments just to show that you are following the film and that you understand some key elements in the film in regards to our discussion of what it means to be Machiavellian. And of course, as usual, we'll watch the very beginning and the first 20 or 25 minutes. So... 